Hi everybody, good morning and welcome to this uh, very exciting, slightly frenetic start here, the northeastern corner of the Kruger National Park on the road. You might be able to see some pug marks. Those pug marks belong to a pack of wild dogs. We've just picked up the tracks now. We're going towards the sort of uh, northern boundary of our reserve. They've obviously come down as the dawn broke here. Just go around the corner and check this clearing. And obviously it's still quite dark, so it's not easy to follow them at any great speed. My name is James Henry. In case you're wondering, David is on camera this morning, and we're extremely excited to bring you on this little adventure that we're going on through the low felt of South Africa. You're on a live safari, which means that we'd like to talk to you throughout the course of the next three hours. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv if you happen to be on the email. We're going to spend the next little while trying to find these wild dogs, which will be very special if we can. And I'm just going to check slowly here. I think they're still going up this way. It is difficult, of course, to follow tracks in this kind of light. There they go. There is a big dam up ahead here where they often center their activities called Sydney's Dam. And while we drive along, just to introduce you to the rest of the team, we've got Kirsten directing this morning, Rebecca tapping away on the keys. To, she'll be receiving your questions and feeding them through to us. And then we've got Steph on the bushwalk. A little bit later, as soon as there's some light, he will go out on the bushwalk. And we just need to check the tracks here. And there's nothing that I can see here. You see, they probably, they may, well, there's some Impala looking pretty chilled out. They may well have headed straight up towards the gate. Let's go back that way. Sleeping Impala. So those dogs obviously came through here some time ago. Because those Impala would not be lurking gently in the, in the clearing having a snooze. So what we'll do is we'll head up towards the northern boundary and then back down the western boundary. They often come up through here and then head into Simbambili, which is the property to the west of us. I hope they don't do that. It's going to keep very close attention to the radio. Sorry, go again with that. So I just need to listen to the radio. They're at Sydney's dam. Copy, do you think I'll get visual, um, visual from the boundary? Here we go. Copy, thank you, and I'll be with you in two minutes. I'm approaching the gate. Hey, hold on tight, everyone. We're going to have to go very quickly to get there. They are right on the northern boundary. Hopefully we'll get there in time, but if then by the time we get there though. So you might have a little bit of black screen for a while, but stay with us if that happens. Roads always feel so very long when you're in a hurry to get somewhere. We're not going to cross the step just yet because it is still a bit dark to be on foot. It's much brighter on your screens, that's reality. This is the side right here, past Edwin's. should be able to find them just about over here. There's the dam just up ahead. Now monkey man, you want to know if wild dogs are diurnal or nocturnal, they're most certainly diurnal, but they hunt crepuscularly, which means they will move in the heat, at least not in the heat of the day, but in the coolth of the dawn and the dusk. I'm just going to quickly get an update now from your hunt. I don't know where he is.
we are north of the boundary one, so I'm sure we'll get a view. But how good that view will be, I don't know. There they come. No. No. There. On the on the road, coming across onto our reserve. Hooray! There they come. Just wave at your hand there. This is brilliant stuff, everybody. They're going to come across the clearing now. There they go. They're on the hunt. Here we go. There's some impala in front of us. The dogs are coming from there. Dave, there come the dogs. The impala running straight past the front of us there. Here come the dogs. There go the impala. We're going to try and follow now. Are you ready, Dave? Yep. Here we go. Hold on tight, everyone. It, gets, it does get very thick in here. See the funny way that the Impala are running. There come more dogs to the left. Here there's another Impala. Two dogs in front. <laughs> That's chaos. Absolute chaos. Running through here. I think they've killed. I think they've killed. Here we go. Two of them. They're all four after one Impala now. There they go. Dogs still in front of us. I know it's difficult to see. Four dogs in front of us. Here the Impala. Oh, watch, 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 watch. The Impala's... Dogs. Two dogs chasing those Impala. Hold on, Dave. Let's just listen now. The dogs need their ears, so we have to switch off as often as we can. Here's a dog right to the right-hand side of us. Two of them coming back. They'll be listening to see if the others have killed. If the others have killed, there'll be a great twittering noise. Can you see these ones here, Dave? No. Let's go, they're right in front of us. There's another one there. Okay, now they're running to this way. They're running down to the south. There, in front of us. There they go. Two over there. One in front. can smell them, that wonderful wet dog smell. Half of them went off into these massive thickets here. Now, I'm just going to switch off. There's one in front of us. It is very important we give them time to listen, everyone. They had those huge ears for a very good reason. They need to listen to each other. There will be a contact call if the rest of them get separated. If the others are eating, if they've killed something, there'll be that loud twittering sound. So, when possible, we need to turn the engine off and start, not rev too loudly. Yep, now they're running again. To the right, to the left of us, Dave. Oh dear. Here we go. Oh dear. Oh, come on. Come on, Wendy. No, come on. I don't believe this. <laughs> Here we go. There, they're all coming back this way now. Two more have come from the front of us, left across the road here. And here come more now. Dave, there's one in front, two to the left. One relieving himself, obviously, as do all dog, all animals, seemingly, when I'm around them. This is interesting. It's not, um, it's not so much territorial behavior. This is fantastic. They will mark like that, though, just to let the others know that they're there. Whew, and there is a real rush. A real rush. My heart rate is up immediately. You start off these mornings soporific and kind of, you know, just getting into the day in a gentle fashion. But it's completely unlike the dogs. I've seen something behind me. amazing isn't this fantastic we've got one two three four here they're listening 
The others, of course, have went off into the pier. Come here, they come. They're coming from the right. Dave, we've got the others coming through the thicket here. And I wonder if the Alpha isn't amongst those because they seem to be still very busy. These others are just hanging on. They're just kind of hanging about the place. And Natasha, you, th um, you want to know which pack this is. I think this is the Investec pack. They're down to about eight. I don't know if you saw that one jumping up there to look over into the thickets. I'm amazed the Impala got away there. I really thought they were going to get one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight so far. I think there are just eight dogs. I believe they lost a few. They had a fight. It seemed a few of them had bite marks. And maybe they had a fight with some hyenas. Possibly even some lions, but most probably hyenas. Now, they, they are listening very carefully. Those big ears are a major thing in their lives. Of course, you don't evolve ears like that for no reason. And I think that their ears play an even greater part in their lives than we think they do. Isn't this wonderful? All you can hear is the call of the virtual starling going, wow, wow. Otherwise, everything is quiet. Bush is kind of shocked there. Look, that one, Dave's got an injury on his shoulder. See there? Straight in front of us. Yeah, nasty injury there. Oh, yes. That's interesting. I don't think it's life-threatening at all, but it is definitely evidence of some physical trauma. It looks like to one of the youngsters to me, one of the young females from the previous litter. Mm. And they're just very nicely to the left here. Look how these, this one is hidden behind that log. He's very cleverly cosseted himself behind a log where he becomes almost log-like, really. Now, I think they will wait for the alpha. They will wait for the alpha male to decide what to do. And he will tell them what to hunt and when to hunt it. And Megan, while we see them lying here, um, you're interested in how much recovery time they might need between sprints. Megan, they are capable, in theory, of running sort of 13 kilometers, which is about, well, in miles. In miles, that's probably about eight, eight or nine miles at supposedly a top speed and uh, before they get too tired. So that little sprint that they did here, I, I think, is, is almost negligible from an energy balance point of view. What is interesting, though, is the latest research is showing precisely what we've just seen here. A lot of them gave half-hearted chases. They didn't actually follow through on a hunt. And so while you might see that as a fail, um, others would say, well, it wasn't really serious. Now, it seems that in only sort of 16% of time, times that these wild dogs see an animal and give semi-chase like they did there, do they actually catch. But because they very quickly assess whether or not it's going to be a successful hunt, um, they are actually much more successful than a lot of other predators because per distance run, they intake a lot more energy than many of the other predators. Now, the other thing to notice there is that there wasn't teamwork there. That didn't look like teamwork to me, and I've just read that they, their teamwork is a lot more suspect than we think it is. So basically what we saw them doing there was just herring after a, a herd of impala. They went in all different directions. There was no coordination. Nobody followed the alpha male on his hunt. And so three went off one way, two went off one way. One stood there looking confused as impala ran everywhere, stotting about. You saw them kicking their back legs out there. And maybe the three adults went off in a coordinated fashion, but the rest ran around like headless chickens. And I think that's because 
probably, you know, the spreading the efforts of the pack are probably more effective than one of them homing in on one impala. And I'm pretty sure they're going to hunt again. Right, while we wait for them to decide what to do next, let's nip across to Steph, say hi to him. He's on foot and we'll be back just now. Well, good morning. Um, and I hear that this has just been a, a never-ending series of excitements for you with these wild dogs. I mean, they're chasing everything down and true to form, James predicted that they'd come back. I'm very, very happy. This morning in the pitch blackness, I asked him what he was going to do and he said he absolutely wants to go and find the wild dog in the dark, which I was very dubious about. But anyway, he did it. So congratulations. I'm glad. Myself and Brian are on foot today and we've come into a block that I've never walked here before. I've crossed it and I've crisscrossed it, but I've never explored it and Brian and I are going to explore that today. That's our plan. It's quite close to our camp actually but uh, for some reason or another it's just one of these unexplored blank areas on my map here between the roads and um, I'm really looking forward to opening this up but you know what we're going to find something exciting for you and I'm sure James doesn't want to lose, the, lose those dogs. So we'll catch up in a little bit. Starting on mm -hmm. They're starting to get active again everyone. Well, one of a few of them are two of them coming towards this group here they'll probably reaffirm their social bonds and then decide what to do next so they've had their little recovery so it was a very good question from megan i think in ottawa about their recovery time look at the one day they're chewing on the chewing on the log and i think they've probably had that recovery time there now and they'll think about going again it's not guaranteed that they'll kill, but it is highly likely that in this kind of hunting foray, while they might not kill every time they chase, they will probably kill. They are unfortunately now look to be heading in a northerly direction, which is back towards Bivol's Hook. So, I mean, they came from here. They went up the main axis where we drove, and then they came back towards Sydney's Dam. They've run back south. So they're obviously patrolling these clearings. They know these clearings are full of impala. And so now they're patrolling them. I find it very difficult to identify who's who in this pack. It's not easy to know who the alpha male is. I think that's him up front. He's got the scaffy ears. Although the pack has just been always oh, so close. Look at that. He's only about, oh, I don't know, three meters, ten feet. There they go. Look at them, heading off like a team. They are the most beautiful animals. All righty, let's move. Come on, Wendy. Come on, Wendy. No, Wendy, don't do that to me. Come on, my girl. Come on. No, no. There we go. Okay, we're okay. They're going north, I'm afraid, across our boundary, I think. Well, we've had a great view, even if we don't see them again after this. I'm just saying thanks to Johan there, because he found them. <laughs> Felicity. Yes, they are quite closely related to our normal dogs, uh, but uh, they don't bury food and cache it for later, no. They're actually one of the few animals that don't. Many canids do, jackals will do that, but Felicity, wild dogs won't bury food, no. There we have them all. Thinking about what to do next, and of course you can never predict what these things are going to do. They're always going off in different directions from the direction you think. They might be covering themselves here in fresh and pile of dung, which will take away their their own smell. Some of them crossing the boundary already. And 
are they getting back on the hunt? Sherry, you say not even a pant. No, not much of a pant at all, Sherry. Um, doing who's done he's rolling in there might be rolling in their own urine in fact that's exactly what that is that's their own urine there here we go here we go back on the hunt they're crossing the boundary everybody going towards sydney's dam We can't follow them there, I'm afraid. But they'll be having thoughts of the meal coming down to drink. Listening, listening. Remember. Becky, I think that you'll find your latter postulation is the correct one. You say, is there any pattern to their patterns? Uh, or is it just kind of random arrangements of colours? It is kind of random. No two dogs are the same. Uh, the only thing that is consistent in probably 95% of wild dogs is that white tail tip. I've seen two males with black tail tips before. But normally it's the white tail tip. There they go off into Buffalo's Hook. And that, I'm afraid, is going to be the last we see of them. We'll zoom in on them for as long as we can. They came a long way down into Vuitella, you know, even before the dawn broke. So although we said they are crepuscular hunters, and this is being evidenced by what they're doing now, they will clearly move before dawn, they'll move before it gets light. I'm amazed they didn't catch any of those Impala. And some of the Impala were just kind of standing around the place. And then they do that stotting thing or they kick their back legs out. Unfortunately, we couldn't bring the super zoom camera. It's giving a bit of an issue. So this is about as long as our lens gets this evening, at least this morning. I think it's worth just sticking around here. I think I'll probably have a bit of a drink there. Might get a slightly better view if we go forward. But I don't think so. thinking about having a drink there's a spoon bill here otherwise there's nothing else for them to eat Around us, the dawn chorus is starting. The kind of tension of the dogs streaming through the area, which tends to shut everything up. It's almost dissipated. Oh, I can see you know what I can see. Um, just keep the camera there, Dave. If you go slightly to the right-hand side of where you are now. Yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, you can't see it. I can see it just with the binoculars that I'm using. There's, an, there's a water buck just sticking his head up over the top of the damn wall to see what's going on there. She's disappeared now. <laughs> she thought better of coming down for a drink now. Actually popped her, popped her head up, thought, ooh, dear, no, no, we'll have a drink later.
Siberia, you say it's it's surprising how much more successful a hunter is when it just dashes at its prey rather than taking the time to stalk. Now you're talking about the traditional thought of the success of leopards and lion hunts versus those of wild dogs. I think this latest research is showing that our initial impressions of how successful dogs are is incorrect. And I think there are trade-offs to both, you know, obviously this is a high-risk strategy, you cannot employ this, the strategy that these guys do unless you have a large number of you, because it is kind of a random shotgun approach where you throw the whole pack at a whole herd of impala and hope that one gets taken down, as opposed to a much more solitary strategy, which would be that of, say, a leopard, which will pick a mark, uh, pick a, uh, you know, a victim, and then take a huge amount of time and patience to then catch that mark. And I think that the latest research showing just exactly how successful they are uh, at hunting shows that they, the, the approach is not necessarily that much more effective than the stalk approach. But the big difference between something like this and a cheetah is that the amount of energy they're able to recoup from their kills is probably greater than that of a cheetah. So although a cheetah kills 26% time, 26% of the time that it chases, the amount of energy that it expends in order to make that kill is far greater proportionally than, say, a wild dog's is. I think that is also quite a nice way of explaining, or does go, go some way to explaining why it is that wild dogs are so endangered. We talk about disease and that makes a big difference, canine distemper and rabies and various other diseases that these dogs are susceptible to. The persecution that uh, certainly farmers gave them in history, I think that makes a big difference. But I think you will also find that they are not quite as successful at hunting as we thought they were. That's wonderful. I know that it's a it's a long way off, everyone, but isn't it great to see those beautiful painted dogs standing on the wall there? Absolutely, James Richard, you're quite correct. Nothing quite wakes you up like wild dogs on the hunt. You'll be driving sort of lazily up the Voyatella access road, suddenly their tracks and your adrenaline rush immediately sends you into a state of complete alertness. I think it's worth sitting here another five minutes or so just to see what they do. Penny Pine, you say you're worried about Sam's elephant, which is the sort of effigy sitting on the front of the of the dashboard here. <laughs> you want to know what I would do? I would have done if it had flown off while we were chasing the dogs. Penny, um, he, it would have been a tough thing. I don't know that I would have... Ha yeah, I mean, we can't really leave Sam's elephant out in the bush, could we? And we'd probably not find it again. So it would have been a really tough decision as to whether we followed the dogs or stop and say, no, 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 just quickly get Sam's elephant. Good point, I'll probably remove it off the dashboard next time the dogs are on the hunt. They're there, they're still on the wall there. And Charlotte and Port Elizabeth, what you may well have noticed, and I think this has precipitated your question as they disappear down there off the damn wall, is do the animals alarm call at wild dogs? And it was pr probably precipitated by the fact that there were no impala alarm calls. Impala don't alarm call at dogs, they just run. They don't even think about alarming, they just get out of the way. Birds, likewise. It seems to be the cats, largely, well, and the snakes, obviously, and birds of prey, that the other animals alarm call at. I've never heard, I don't think I've heard squirrels having a go at dogs, I might have. I've never heard impala alarm calling when the dogs are on the hunt. If the dogs, if they were to come into a clearing and there were dogs standing there, they probably would alarm call. But because they know 
that the dogs are not stalking predators. So the dogs will run at them from any distance. There's no point in them alarm calling. They just have to get out of the way fast. Whereas with a leopard, once the alarm call has a, the effect of telling the leopard also that it's been spotted. And so once the leopard's been spotted, um, it will normally slink away. And so the impala are saying, hey, 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 I've spotted you. I can see you. I know you there. And that re has the re re um, effect of reducing the es or de-escalating the situation of conflict between the leopard and the impala. Whereas with these guys, because they don't stalk, there's no point in them doing that. All right, everyone. Well, that's our wild dog sighting for the morning. Uh, we'll keep you posted if they come back towards the south. Otherwise, let's go and see what else we can find. We'll drive a line along the northern boundary here and try and pick up some tracks. Wendy now is not so shocked. She's able to stop. Chris, um, you're interested in. I think it's much too early. Uh, late April, I'd say, maybe uh, period, which was sort of July time. Yeah, so I mean, pregnancy has been uh, reported in the Sands pack. I don't know about this one, not dating yet. I think early June. Um, but I think that even that would be very early. So I think it's highly unlikely. I'm pretty sure that we've got three adults left in this pack and eight of the original pack. At least eight of the, uh, not eight, uh, no, only five of the original pups. Anyway, we're going to drive along here, see what we, if there are any more tracks coming across that they don't double back towards the south. While we do that, let's go across to Steph. Well, myself and Brian in this block that we've been uh, we've been been in for the the morning while you've been enjoying those wild dogs. We've actually been on the tracks of the wild dogs. They came quite deep into Juma last night, almost all the way into quarantine, and it's really bizarre. I mean, as I'm sure James has said to you, it's quite overcast. There's a high level of cloud around, but it was dark last night. I mean, when we woke up this morning, you could hardly even see your hand in front of your face. And contrary to what we're reading in books all the time. We're seeing the wild dog has definitely been here for most of the evening. And they were quite far away from here last night. When they were on an adjacent property, for them to move in the dark like this is dangerous. The only thing that I can say is probably the lack of lion. <coughs> um, the lack of lion that, that is on the property at the moment may have, have induced it. They could be hungry. They could have been chased from that area to this area. But definitely from the tracks that we've been seeing on the floor today, they spent a lot of last night wandering around this property, which is amazing. And uh, you learn something new here every day. Talking about learning something new, <coughs> we faced with this impenetrable wall of green, as you can see here in front of us. And Brian and I are actually trying to look for a big animal path. It's an animal path that joins quarantine to Sydney's dam. And it's almost like a highway. And I want to go and find that pathway and I want to walk up and down it. And I want to see what we can see on top of that. that. We, you come to us as we were sitting here just listening. We're listening to the bush in front of us just to hear if anything's moving on the other side or through it. It's never a good idea just to walk through here. Not that it's dangerous, you just got to be cautious. So Ramey has just asked us, would a wild dog run off uh, if it had to see us on foot? And Ramey, we had the most amazing sighting the other day. Myself and James were on foot. I was, I was the security detail for James who was hosting the walk with Andrew. And we heard that some wild dog were in the area. We wanted to go give them a hand because the vehicles had lost the dogs in this particular block that we're in at the moment. And we came out onto the road and the dogs ran straight up to us. And you know, our old tracker friend of mine, um, a mentor protege and a very, very good friend of mine called Richard in Duban, he had once told me when I was a trainee that he was walking down the road and wild dogs ran right past him, around him, didn't even give him the time of day and carried on with their day. And this was just going through my mind, going through my mind. And we stopped on the road, we sank down behind a bush and these dogs did exactly that. They walked straight up to us, they walked to about maybe two or three yards away from where we were looking at us, making this funny little huff sort of growl at us and then they carried on with their day. They didn't even, they, they absolutely weren't aggressive for one and B, they didn't seem to fear us. It was almost like a, 
um, I, I can't really explain it. it would be, yeah, a very surreal experience. I don't know what else to say there. Words escape me right now, but very nice. So to answer your question, Ramey, <clears throat> no, they won't run away from you unless you're running at them or pose some significant threat. And we weren't posing any threats. And even if I had to see them now, I think I'd probably repeat the, I'd try and repeat the, the situation. Brian and I would sit down and we'd just see what the dogs had to do. Even though they are such voracious predators, um, they just hold very little fear for me, which is, I suppose, time will tell whether that will work or not. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> I hope that helped you, Ramey. And uh, it's given us some time to listen to the bush here in front. This wall of green would harbor something like a buffalo or some elephant that are moving through it. I think I'm trying to find a way that Brian and this aerial, he's already tall. Now, with an aerial on his back, it's like threading a giraffe through these areas. It's okay. We'll move all this stuff. It's given us some time to listen here. So what I'm expecting to find in here, things like buffalo or elephant. And although they generally, are, they, they're considered very dangerous animals, you leave them alone, they leave you alone. That's the sort of the unspoken rule in the bush. It's all about respect the largest or respect the angriest. And uh, and that's what we're going to do. So right now we're quite close to a crest and that means that the vegetation is pretty uniform. And <clears throat> it's because the soil on these crests is very well drained and obviously well drained soils are good for some species of plants but not for others. Um, very good for grasses out here and uh, so these crests are really good for animals from a feeding point of view, but not really that good to walk through because uh, it, it tends to be this uniform plant growth that you see. So we're going to be heading downhill a little bit. And uh, while we're heading down there, I just want to answer a question from, <coughs> from Natasha, who's just asked me, what are the most common mistakes that people make when they're walking in the bush? Um, that's actually a very good question, Natasha, to be quite honest with you. I think from my experience, the most common mistake people make is lack of respect. You know, human beings, I suppose, have this natural arrogance around them because we're the top predator or we're the top species on the planet. We've got, we exude this arrogance. Things must move out of our way. Things must heed us. Things must uh, go away. And it's born of either a fear or a misunderstanding or you know, but generally speaking, I, I, I pull it back to this arrogance that humans have and this lack of respect that comes from it. Um, whereas out here, I think the best way, the safest thing that you can do is just realize that you're part of the food chain and uh, we're not that capable, let me put it to you that way, without our brains, without all these funny pieces of equipment that I have around me, um, we would be really nothing much. But. Uh, I'll tell you what we are going to do, we're going to skirt this termite mound, we're going to try and get Brian through these branches, and while we do that and move a little bit further down slope, see if we can find that game path, I'm going to send you back through to James so we can make a little bit of time. Much more peaceful in this little part of the reserve, two zebras or two or three zebra, and a whole lot of impala, just eating their grass, having their breakfast and the peace and knowledge that they are relatively safe, the dogs have headed north and west into the Banileti, which is a reserve to the north of Biffleshook and, and um, well, north of the Sabi Sands. And they're feeding in this particular area. We're still on the northern cut line or the Biffleshook cut line because there is a fire break and this kind of relatively open area at which the zebra are is a good place for them to graze. They're good grazing grasses here. And also, it's a good clearing for them to see what might be coming to eat them. For example, wild dogs. Zebra, not so much a threat from dogs. I suppose small ones would be, but they'd be very nervous of a stallion who will do them some serious damage. But those impala will certainly be very afraid of wild dogs. And they'll be hanging around to each other, with each other, for the extra sets of eyes that they provide each other. Security detail. Righty, that's them. Let's move on. You can see the 
Ooh, dear. Something in me eye. Wide expanse of the Borsal cut line over to the west. East. Hello, Macy. You ask a very valid and interesting question about migrations and a, uh, with a change of seasons, you're wondering if there's going to be some kind of change in the animal suite that we'll see here. Will there be some kind of migration to and from and into the area? And the answer is no, not really, and I'll explain more about that now. I'm not sure who on earth that was. Anyway. <laughs> May see, because the Sabi Sands is an area where they have pumped permanent water, so we've got lots of pans and things where there will be water all the time, there is no need for animals to migrate away from the area. If you go up to the Timbavati or into the Mandaleti, the vegetation is very similar. You will get small localized movements. So, for example, in the far eastern side of Torchwood and in the far southern reaches of the Sabi Sands, we've got a different kind of geology. Now that geology is called gabbro and that produces different grazing grasses which are good in the early summer they're not good in the winter time they get very long and straw like and so what you'll find is that there will be small localized movements probably up to the northern sabi sands or into the just the granite areas and i mean by small localized movements i mean by a matter of a few kilometers rather than sort of vast uh, vast migrations like you're thinking of in perhaps East Africa. Now in East Africa the movements are relatively seasonal I suppose but I mean they're largely random as well they're based on where the rain is and so those wildebeest that migrate in those huge numbers across the Serengeti and the and the Masai Mara move according to the clouds that they watch. It's not it's not as predictable as it might seem but out here, no, there's no real reason for the animals to move anywhere. There's nowhere, there's nowhere in the Sabi Sand that you can move where you are more than two and a half kilometers or so from water. That is about 1.8 miles, I guess. a lovely inquiry from a, a lovely a lovely twitter handle james henry's old hat um, you, you want to know if i think that re animal research is prone basically to the bias or opinions of the researcher in question uh, james henry's old hat i'd say it's almost inevitable i'd say 90 percent of the time uh, a normal well a huge body of animal research is unquestionably influenced by the bias of the supposed scientists involved in the research. Now remember, I mean, you get research and you get research. You get academic research, which is peer-reviewed. You've always got to ask yourself, who is, uh, who's funding the research? Why is it they're searching for the results? So for example, lots of bird research out here is, uh, is funded by uh, some of the worst environmental transgressors in the country. Um, the, the paper farms, the, you know, the paper mills and the guys who have the paper forests, they will, and the oil companies will sponsor huge amounts of environmental research. Can that research be trusted? Well, if it doesn't say anything nasty about the effects of the environment, the effects of oil production and oil exploration and tree exploration and, you know, the cutting down of indigenous forests to plant exotic forests, uh, well, then yes, maybe you can trust the research. But if it starts to move into those areas, then I'd say pretty, pretty safely you can't trust it. Now, the same must go, of course, for mammal research out here. There will be various vested interests. It's just completely inevitable as far as human beings are concerned. So, you know, there's that side of it. There is the side of it that says, uh, you know, well, we're certainly biased towards certain opinions. And what you find is with the older researchers especially, they will get fixed upon something that they thought, think they discovered when they were very young, and that will become gospel for them. And they'll be very, it'll be very difficult for them to change their opinions of what's going on, to, even in the face of almost over.
Beefalo, everybody. Beefalo. Sorry about the lack of signal. I'm afraid we lost a battery because of the cloud cover that has failed. Uh, well, it has not failed. It has hidden the sun, which in turn has failed to recharge the batteries that one run one of the repeaters. So sorry about that, but we are back online now. Well, for the meantime, we'll see what happens as we move. Um, I think if we go too much forward from where we are now, we'll probably lose that tower again, but it is being... ...sorted out. Connor is, <laughs> is driving around the bush trying to find the repeater, but I think the cloud cover, which has masked the sun, of course, has made his directional sense just uh, slightly reduced, and so he's apparently a little bit lost. Anyway, that is the joy of living out here, I suppose. It's a constant state of exploration. I've got no idea what I was talking about when I last saw you. Uh, we did have some leopard tracks, but I think they were quite old. Oh, yes, I now remember. Well, I don't remember. Kirsten remembered and she told me. Um, we were talking about research and oh, that's very nice that's a lovely picture Dave look at that the buffalo is uh, is going to the loo and then sort of spreading with his tail that's lovely to see in the morning <laughs> I think it's very good that you haven't zoomed in on his bottom very tasteful film So James Henry is old hat. We were talking about research and bias and possible um, inaccuracies in research caused by scientists' own opinions or researchers' own opinions. And I was just saying I think it happens all the time and how stuck on one point of view we get, especially as researchers, uh, despite being faced with overwhelming evidence to the contrary of what we once thought. Classic example being those wild dogs. where we thought, you know, I have quoted many, many times that a wild dog has a 70% success rate when it hunts. And the new research is based not on plain, on, on plain human observation, but on putting radio collars on a pack of dogs and, you know, tracking them over the course of thousands of hunts indicates that it's just not the case. Natasha, you were chatting to Steph earlier about the most common mistakes. Here's this old buffalo boy. He's a very wizened old fellow. What the bigger mis mistakes you can make are when you're walking in the bush. And you now want to know what the biggest mistakes you can make while driving in the bush are. Well, I think the biggest mistake we can make while driving is to not acknowledge the effect that we have on the, an on the animals and their behavior. We like to have as little effect as possible. But, for example, when we're following those wild dogs, I've done it so many times, and actually very, only very recently have I've come to appreciate that our revving engines, that's the Natal Franklin just running across the front of that <laughs> buffalo, I've only just come to kind of realize how much, how important their ears are when they're hunting. And it must make a huge difference to their hunting success rate with engines revving around them. And for a long time, I thought, well, well, they're just obviously hunting by sight and by smell. I'm sure they use their ears, but, you know, we can just drive fast next to them and I'm sure we don't have an effect. I'm really struggling to believe that that's the case anymore. And if you watch those dogs today, every time, we, every time they stopped, they listened. So when we switched off, it must make a huge difference. So, if you extend that example into everything else we do here, the biggest mistakes you can make are to be insensitive to how an, anim to an animal senses and to the effect that we could possibly be having on them. So I think insensitivity is a, is a, is a blanket term I would use for the biggest mistakes you can make while driving. Followed closely by complacency, especially in the face of 
potentially dangerous animals like, uh, like elephants. So let's take this buffalo as an example. He's not potentially dangerous to us in the vehicle at all, even if he were to turn around and chase the vehicle um, and bash into it, we would be completely safe. But obviously we would have crossed a line and we don't want to ever do that. And so by stopping where I did here, I stopped because he turned around and he faced us. And he turned around and he faced us because he was kind of saying to us, you know what, I'm, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable. So if you wouldn't mind just hanging back a bit, that would be great. Which is now what we've done. And of course, Natasha, the other, the other thing is that the, you know, when we, when we drive around in an area like this, as soon as you put a camera or people on the back of your vehicle, the pressure on the presenter or the guide is always to get the best shot or the most exciting shot. And that is a, it's a, it's a danger, oh, sorry, quickly, there are those Natal Franklins on the ground there. We don't often see them, but we hear them making a dreadful racket all the time. But that's, I think they're one of our prettiest Franklins. Well, I think they're all quite pretty, but they've got nice orange-pink legs and an orange-pink beak, just like to hide in the bushes. So, Natasha, the thing is to try and keep your ego out of this sort of game, because it looks, makes great TV to have an elephant up close and personal, and it makes great TV to have a you know, uh, be almost on top of a lion pride. But sometimes it's not the most sensitive thing to do. And so we're always constantly evaluating each other as to our own sensitivity to the wild. And unfortunately, there are still many audiences, of course, many audiences around the world who you know, I mean, they don't know about the wild, so it's difficult for them. And when they see guys walking into lions on foot or, you know, having sensational elephant charges at the vehicle, they think, well, that's just exciting and it's a very dangerous place that, you know, that we all live in. And that's just not true. So often it's just human-induced for a good shot or a good, good ex uh, an exciting experience, which, of course, is not what the wilderness is about and certainly not what we're about. All right, good news, everyone. The Gari repeater is up, so we don't need to remain with this Franklin for the rest of the drive, even though he is a very special little fellow. We're going to turn around now and head towards Bifelsuk Dam and see what we can find around there. While we do that, Steph is still wandering about the place on foot, the encyclopedic brain that Stefan Winterboer is. Let's find out what he's got to show you. Well, we've had the most wonderful morning while you've been waiting for our picture to come back. And I know Connor's had a pretty exciting day. I think he's been lost trying to find the Gary Repeater. <laughs> Happens out here. It's almost like a rite of passage actually being lost, to be honest with you. And I found that even after 17 years working outside here, myself and Brian are pretty lost where we are now. I couldn't pinpoint where we are inside this particular block any more than Connor could pinpoint where <laughs> the Gary Repeater was this morning. But what that has done is it's allowed us to explore this previously unexplored drainage line for us. And I mean, we've come to this little grove that we just want to share with you. It's, it's on the bend of this drainage line. There's obviously a lot of water here, and I'll tell you why. Immediately what's apparent off to the right-hand side is this place where a wallow has been formed. And the wallow is here because, for some other reason, there's probably a clay bank that I'm sitting on at the moment, and a subterranean water is welling up underneath there. And you can see by evidence of all the green around us. Have a look at the green. Brian's just going to pan around and you'll see that you're going a lot of green grass. That's not really this summer grass, this late summer grass we've been having. You can absolutely see it's sedgy almost. thing about doing what you're doing now, this slow 360, is that you'll actually see that we're not surrounded by 400 cars helicopter, hot air balloon with military support for us. It's just literally myself and Brian really just enjoying a most fantastic morning. Now one of the benefits 
of this bushwalk camera, this phenomenal camera and this phenomenal system that we've got at the moment, is that we can share really small things with you. And I'm sitting next to a flower here, this very delicate purplish blue flower. I have absolutely no idea what this flower is. We're going to take, we're going to take a picture of it now and we're going to go and identify it at camp. But flowers for me are, are fascinating things. A is a flower is like a, a bird's feather or the scales on a butterfly's wings. They're there to attract something, either a bird or an insect. In this particular case it's an insect. And this is, an, this is a flower that's attracting an insect that feeds from above. So it's not a beetle, it's probably a moth or a butterfly of some sort. The plant is up and you'll see all its reproductive parts are there. There's the female parts and the male parts are further in. So this moth will come in and literally land on the flower and get dusted by pollen on top of its head. You can see there where the pollen dusting parts, those there are quite long parts. So I would imagine that this is for an insect of variable head length that comes in and gets dusted with pollen and then goes to another plant and does exactly the same thing. You know what else is, for us this plant is blue, but they reflect and they refract different wavelengths of light and, and insects can actually see into different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum than we can. And so they can see into the ultraviolet spectrum, they can see into the infrared spectrum, um, and although it sounds alien to us, uh, it's very common for that. So this under a different spectrum of light might look yellow, might look bright white, might look orange with purple spots, I'm not too sure. You know, my imagination is running away with me today. Brian and I have been discussing chaos theory and uh, it's actually been quite interesting, but it's allowed my imagination to run wild. But I tell you, we're going to carry on walking down this little drainage line here and for as long as what's possible, you're going to be joining us to do that. We just wanted to share the peace and quiet of this glade with you. Ah, good question coming through from Dave. Good morning, Dave. Have we ever had an animal follow us while we've been on walk? And Dave, um, up until probably about a month or two ago, I would say yes, but only once. Uh, but James and I were followed by an elephant the other day on walk. And the, the first time it happened to me, it was an elephant as well. Twice in my life, I've been followed by elephant. And then I have colleagues that have been followed by lion. Um, the concept of a man-eating lion or man-eating tigers is a very well-documented concept. And in the Kruger National Park on the Lobombo mountain range, up until about the late 1990s, early 2000s, the lion prides there used to actively follow people. They were very, very well known uh, for hunting people. And I got to a point where a lion pride that had been in this particular area were well-known man-eaters in the 90s, but had grown out of it and didn't follow you around um, when I got there. But stories of my predecessors definitely said that lion follow you. So yes, lion follow people, elephant follow people. I've had experience with elephant not nice being followed by an elephant, I must be honest with you. Um, the only way to really get around it is to go upwind and to hightail it out of there. So get, put the wind in your face and just carry on going. But talking about that, we're going to carry on going over here. Now, uh, Brian, I think it's going to get difficult here. We're following this drainage line, which is getting deeper and deeper as we're moving on it. And it's a little bit tough to walk unimpeded next to the drainage line. So what we'll do is we'll make little journeys to it when we see an interesting feature, like, like, what, uh, like where we've just been. But... We're back on this game path, as you can see, it's a game path, not a very well trodden one, but a game path nonetheless. And uh, what we're going to do is look for the next interesting thing to show you. And while we're doing that, send you across to James. That of course is to assume that James has something interesting as well, which he does not at this stage. Ooh, I say that. There are some white flowers, David. What I want to do is smell them, because white flowers normally smell delicious. Let's see if those ones hold true. Uh, uh, the uh, effects of yesterday's touch rugby game are uh, totally...
taking their toll on my aged bones and muscles. Oh, that is spectacular. It's even worth the spike I got to my face from the thorns here. Oh, um, there are so many buds here, everybody, that I'm actually going to pick one because I know that there are going to be a lot more of these flowers on this very bush. I feel it would be, it would be very unkind of me to leave here with not letting you and David smell. Oh, smell that. Beautiful. Very nice. Beautiful. What do you, how would you describe it? Floral. Floral, a little bit minty. Minty? Yeah. Bit of mint. Quite a lot of floral. Have a smell, everybody. Take a deep breath in. Bit of jasmine. It's quite sweet, though. It's very mm. sweet. Delicious. So white flowers often have a very nice smell about them. That fly is going to die. <coughs> Lucky I can barely move. All right, on we go. Back in the car in half an hour. Be glad I didn't have to chase those wild dogs on foot today. I fear we would have missed them. That fly is still with me. Okay. Thankfully, those guests at Voyatella are going home today, which means that they won't insist on another hour and a half of touch rugby, which means tomorrow we might have recovered. Here you are, Mr. Elephant. Why don't you smell that? Mmm. There we go. I don't know what the flower is, by the way. I'm... Yeah, I suppose I should I should know, but I don't. It's a creeper. And there are many, many wonderful books around the place written about the wildlife of this area. But there are some inescapably poor flower books. Lots of good tree and mammal and bird books around, but flowers, not so much. And before the inevitable question is, why don't you write one? Uh, the answer is, uh, no, I don't want to write one. I think the thought of writing a field guide for someone of my level of concentration ability uh, is just not appropriate. Hello Leopold, you want uh, me to tell you a personal story about where I really learned something about being in the bush. I think they're almost countless, Leopold. I think the first one I learned was, well, I don't know. I mean, my very first bushing. Let's, let's use an experience from this area um, or from similar area was the 10 days unarmed walking that I did. And I mean, you must chat to Sam about this the next time he's on drive. One of the bits of the parts of the training that I did was to have to walk the reserve that I was on unarmed and this buffalo is in, a, in an appropriate position for this talk. And alone. And that at the time for me was a tremendously terrifying thing because I knew very little about the bush. I was convinced that everything out here was out to get me. And I remember the first time that I saw a buffalo bull, there were four of them lying in a clearing. I came around the corner and I saw them lying there, they didn't even look up at me. And I swore loudly, turned round and ran back up the road, which of course is entirely the wrong thing to do. You just stop, turn gently and walk away. But those 10 days that I spent all alone in the wild, armed with nothing but a stick and a dodgy first aid kit, were certainly some of the most profound lessons that I learned about the wild. I learned about how animals perceive humanity, how they see us as a threat, 
and what our place is in the wild. And so that was a profound learning experience for me, Leopold. I saw elephants and buffalo, no cats. I saw wild dogs on foot and it was a tremendously um, soul-searching and, uh, well, initially terrifying and at the end enthralling experience to have the whole of the African wild there with nothing but my wits to protect me. And that was a very special time. So I think that's a, you know, there's one story, but there are countless others about, and many of them actually have to do with learning about our place as human beings in the wild. And I mean, there are greater lessons, uh, not just lessons about, you know, how to operate in the bush from a practical level, but there's some very, uh, not to put, not to be too sort of twee about it. There's some very spiritual lessons to learn about being in the wild. And I think that's, that's probably why I'm, <laughs> it was a, a lilac wrist and roller that's flown off. Um, then there are lessons, there are lessons to, to learn about the local people and the local uses and the local um, culture around wilderness areas. So just countless lessons, Leopold. I've learned more out here in the bush than I ever did at university. Thank you for your question. Let's head back across to, let's head back across to Steph, who has found a hole. <laughs> James's links are always very comical. And yes, we have found a hole, but we've also found a lot more than that. <laughs> we've also found a vantage point onto this drainage line we've been, uh, we've been uh, following the course of. And apart from it just being a nice place, there's some things that are really interesting here. One is that here we can see all the way down this watercourse and you can see from the vegetation in the watercourse that there is still a lot of water here. And that led Brian and I down here to come and have a look at a seep. And in the seep we found tracks of an aardvark or an ant bear. The aardvark is the Afrikaans or Southern African colloquial name. The generic name for it is an ant bear around the world. And these uh, we keep on coming back to their tracks because they are so rare to see out here. They really are. I mean, in a 10-year in a career or in a 20-year career, you'd be lucky to see four or five of them here. Lucky to see four or five of them here. Tingana seems to be doing his fair share at eating them all um, when he comes across them. And I have no doubt that when he does come across them, it looks very similar to where we are here. And we found, by tracking this ant bear, we found where he lives. And this is where he's staying. He's excavated this enormous termite mound on the banks of this drainage line and that hole that you're looking at over there is where he stays. So they've used their claws and dug out there and I'm, we know he's in there because you can see how fresh the sand has been turned around the entrance and being kicked and cascaded down the side here. So generally if I had to walk up there now, um, he won't come out. There's, uh, they sleep during the day, they're very highly nocturnal. Uh, radio collared individuals at 11 o'clock usually back in a den site again by 4 o'clock in the morning. So way before we decide to drive around over here. But other points of interest over here is we've got the red-headed weaver's nest that's at the top there, this untidy basket of, of, uh, of nest there. And unlike the masked weavers and the, um, the other weavers that you find around water, um, this, these guys make these untidy nests with these long tunnels, but is for me one of the most striking of the weavers. Um, I don't have a bird book on me now, my backpack is full of breakfast bars and water and first aid kits, but you're welcome to go and Google a red-headed weaver, and there are some of the most striking birds that we have out of here. Further off to our right hand side, we have probably got one of the biggest tambuiti trees that I've seen on the, on the property. These tambuiti trees are the African Ebony's African sandalwood in actual fact, or Af African cedar as it's, as it's called, not African ebony, that's the jackalberry, but the tambuti tree, um, one of them that's commonly talked about on drive, but this one is just enormous. And it's always good to pay your respects to an old tree. This tree has been around a long time, probably close to 400 to side of this drainage line for 600 years.
Now, I'm doing that, everyone, because there are drongos flying up and down, bombing something in that tree. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? They're very cross. And I suspect there's a bird of prey in the tree, and they're leaping up and down, bombing it. Let's go a little bit forward. And I was doing the call in the hopes that it might respond so that we would know whether it was a pearl-spotted owl. It's most likely a small bird of prey like a pearl-spotted owl that the drongos are shouting at. Unless they're just chasing each other. Well, they've gone now. That was wonderful to watch. Unbelievable in the air. They're just like little fighter planes. And of course, the question as to why they have those forked tails, I think is very nicely answered when you watch them moving like that. The forked tail does provide momentum, and not momentum, provides maneuverability, because what it does is it's, it's able to fan out. And so from being very thin, which is great if you're in a dive, by f f fanning out like that, it allows the birds to change direction very quickly. And I don't think it's any surprise that many of the swallow species have got forked tails like that, which allow them to pull unbelievable g-force on their brains, small bodies and small brains, as they chase insects through the air. And Frank, you want to know if those drongos don't mimic other birds. Uh, they do, Frank, not very well though. They're one of the poorer mimics. Listen here, there was those Franklins are going ballistic. Lots of birds calling around here. Great activity. It's a Frankton you can hear going in the background. And there the robin. Dave, on, in this little bit of uh, dead thorn bush on the right-hand side, yeah, just go a little bit left of there, yeah, in there, there's a bird hopping about, there, it's a chagra, everybody, that's a brown crowned chagra, oh, there's his call, I didn't know he made that call, he's got a very beautiful sort of lilting whistle as well, but that's obviously another call that he makes, Otherwise, he goes, <laughs> no, that's the black crown chagra. He goes, um, what does he do? I'm going to play it for you, rather than try and whistle it. There he is. Brilliant. Well done, Dave. While we look at him, I'll play his call for you. Here he goes. Are you ready? Isn't that nice? Let me stop before we freak that bird out. Such a pretty call. So he's from the Shrike family. He's got that very obvious tooth on the front of his bill, and that's used, of course, to catch insects. Um, not to chew them, but to catch them and spear them and then eat them. Yum. Come on, Wendy. We're on our way to Bibblesook Dam, everyone. So the, uh, just back to Frankie, I think it's Frankie's question about the mimics. Yes, absolutely, drongos do try and mimic other birds. They're not very good, though. The best mimics out here are probably the humble Sabota lark and also some of the robin species. The bearded robin that we get here and down further towards the river, the white-throated robin, and which we do find here, but uh, not very often. And then sometimes also the white-browed, not white-browed scrub robin, but the white-browed robin chat, which used to be known as the Hugelins robin. They're very good mimics. I'm just still listening to the game drive radio to find those dogs, I think. Yeah, they're still in the Manuleti. I don't think anyone spotted them again. So 
I think we got the best view of them. I was just saying to Dave, it was starting to feel a little bit like yesterday in terms of, uh, you know, the activity out here. And he reminded me, of course, that uh, after those dogs, well, nothing's going to be quite as exciting. There were some male leopard tracks around this area. Well, you were off screen, but they weren't very fresh. And I think they've gone also onto Biffles Hook. Anyway, let's see what what transpires. Haven't seen a mvula for a long time. Our old favorite male leopard. Don't know where he is right now. Right, let us go back across to Steph. I think he's found probably another hole or something like that. <laughs> James and his holes. I tell you. All right, so what we've got here is another hole, but once again, it's not just a simple hole. This is something that I've never seen before. And I know Brian will probably be on a wide right now and you'll see some movement. But have a look inside this hole and see if you can count the creatures that are inside this hole. There's at least six of these creatures. I have yet to identify them. I do know what they are, but I have yet to identify them to the species level. But can you see them? This hole is just jam-packed with frogs. Have a look at them, just moving everywhere. Can you see them all? They're definitely frogs of some sort. They're definitely adults. And there are probably five or six adults inside this hole. Can you see this one here, Brian? Now, we get a puddle frogs and we get sand frogs here. We also get rain frogs. These are not rain frogs. I'm just going to try and pick one up and just see what they are. So I have no doubt that this pond, which has just recently dried up after the rain that we've had, was harboring these tadpoles. And they have now, they've now transformed into frogs and they are now living in this, in this pond, eating the insects that have come down to this moisture. But literally we are surrounded by maybe 50 or 60 of these little guys. And uh, yeah, snoring puddle frogs, sand frogs. I'm not that well versed on frogs that live in puddles like this. This is the first time I've actually seen one. I actually got one, they're burying into the sand here. And it's just, there's one there, two there, three, four, five in the same hole. <laughs> Isn't this wonderful? Flash coloration on their back, so that blue. So that would be a deterrent for predators. As they jump away, they flash that color, and that startles a predator. They have not got grainy skin at all. They're not toads, they're definitely frogs. And you're welcome to please try and help me identify these guys, I would love to know what frogs these are. So we're in a depression, we're in a drainage line. We are standing in an old puddle, a seep, a clay bottomed seep. There are probably 50 or 60 of them and as you saw that slight bluish tinge that they had to the, their skin. Their skin is not granulated, is not rough, it's, it's a smooth skin. They are not toads, they're definitely frogs and I know that because toads have got a very definite gland just behind their, 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 their eyes basically. And all the toads here have this gland where they secrete a toxin called bufotoxin. This frog does not have that. So it's a frog living here in a depression, definitely not dependent on water it would seem, not at this particular stage of their life cycle. And um, you're welcome. Please, please do send through any of your suggestions. I can share it with everyone. Uh, you can use questions at wildearth.tv or you can use the hashtag Safari Live and uh, please do send them through. Right now, myself and Brian are going to carry on looking for another hole to show you, hopefully with some more life in it. <laughs> Come along. I'm actually very pleased that we, uh, 
that we ended up coming down here. I wasn't going to, to be quite honest. James Henry's old hat, which I've, uh, I have no doubt is a, is a <laughs> nice name, wants to know what happens if you encounter black mamba on foot. Um, nothing, you just stand very still. Obviously, with something like a black mamba, which is an edgy snake, which is a nervous snake, you are watching that snake the whole time. You're watching his head. If he looks like he's going to strike you, I would move backwards as fast as I can. Um, anything out here enjoys creating distance. So as soon as you are in a compromised position, generally creating distance diffuses a situation unless you are right in it, where that animal thinks that any movement you make is a trigger for an attack. Um, and that's why I'm saying if you're walking down a black mamba and you're that close, definitely watch that head. If you can move out of the way before a strike happens, do it. Otherwise, just stand right still, let that animal create some distance or you can create some distance and usually that diffuses things. I'm not too worried about a black mamba. Um, yes, if it bites you, you've got some problems out here, definitely. But similarly, if you get struck by lightning or if a coconut falls on your head or if you get stuck in deep water and you get tired, it's going to end up with the same result. It's, you know, one of those things. It's your time, it's your time, in my opinion. All right, let's carry on going. That was really nice. Hey, Brian? Yeah. It's yeah, interesting, right. eh? Snoring puddle frog. That's exactly what I thought. Snoring puddle frog, when I first got it, I think I mentioned it as we stopped. Snoring puddle frog is coming through as some answers for this little frog. Yes, except a snoring puddle frog, as far as my memory serves me, has quite a granulated skin. This is a smooth skin. You're welcome to go and have a look at some pictures of snoring puddle frogs and let us know if their skin is granulated or not. Um, like I say, you know. A memory that has been, a brain like mine that has been sunburnt for as many days as it has been, has holes in it when it comes to recollection. When I'm driving around in the Landies, I have this huge box of books. But um, while we carry on out of here and while uh, Brian and I mull over what this frog is, James is a big pachyderm to show you. My big pachyderm is hiding behind a very small bush. There he is. And there's a herd of elephants here, and we're quite close to them. Sort of only, well, about 10 meters, 30 feet from the closest cow, and I'm just assessing how they feel about us. I think they're pretty relaxed. So what I'm going to do is just sneak forward, and we'll get a view of the big cow behind. I think it must be the matriarch. stop here. They are in relatively thickish bush, so we don't want to make too much noise around them. Our view won't be great, but what is fascinating here, look at the one eating there. And that one eating there has got no tusks. You see that? The one chewing there on the branch has got no tusks. And that means that she has to chew, like she's doing, on those branches. She can't break them off using her tusks and her trunk. And so people often ask, does it make a difference if elephants don't have tusks or not? And the answer is yes, it does, but they adapt. Look at the other one tossing sand on his back. They apparently do that for parasites. But I think they just like the feeling of it as well. And there's another one behind. You can hear maybe the sand falling into the bushes behind. She's also digging in the sand and throwing sand all over herself. A very peaceful little herd here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. Sandy, you wondering if elephants are more unpredictable than other animals. Sandy, I don't think so. Um, I think elephants are pretty predictable if you understand how they feel and if you read their body language. 
I guess it can be sometimes a little bit difficult. <laughs> this is a classic case of elephants trying to show dominance over each other and just horsing about the place. That is amazing. And the sound of the, their skins rubbing against each other. Look at the four of them there. one is excluded to the left hand side there. The very little one is now going to seek the company of his mum. The older kids don't want to play with him. <laughs> this is fantastic to see. So Sandy, I don't think they're more unpredictable. I think if you understand their behavior, if you understand their things that make them upset I think they're, they're pretty predictable but you just never know when you see them what they have experienced it is very seldom that an elephant will just turn and be angry with you or change its mood so these elephants here are pretty calm around us the one the large one off to the right hand side is definitely listening to me or listening to something down in the drainage line I'm not sure what so were her mood were her mood to change, I wouldn't be that surprised. I'm not sure why it would, but I wouldn't be that surprised if she was to turn and shake her head at us. The thing with elephants, though, is that if you don't know what they've been experiencing, you can come across them and then get a surprise. But if you watch them carefully, they will just, just about always give you an indication of how they feel. Of course you can make a mistake, of course you can misinterpret the behavior. That's entirely possible. But I don't think they're completely unpredictable. These chaps are having a right old fight. Two young bulls trying to show each other who's boss. And this tusk, oh no, she's got tusks, this one. And the little one just lay down there, just got up. And of course, a little elephant of that age, probably about 18 months, doesn't have to eat so much so they can afford to play around a bit. The big adults, well, I mean, they're eating probably 18 hours a day. Mm -hmm. I'm just playing with a stick while it's bigger brothers and sisters play with each other. Moshe, a very nice question as we watch these chaps horsing about in the cooth of the morning. And the little one getting in the way and getting bashed unceremoniously out of the way. <laughs> Moshe, you want to know how they cope with the heat in the summer? Well, in a number of ways. You say, especially in the case of a water shortage, how would they cope? Water is not often used by elephants as a cooling mechanism in this area because there's obviously often not a lot of it. But sometimes they will swim to be cool, but they don't have to swim. Yes, drinking does help them to cool down, I suppose. But it's not necessarily always the case that they have to drink to cool down. They have to drink to maintain their diets and to maintain the digestive system. They remain cool by standing in the shade. They remain cool by covering themselves in mud. They also have this, these remarkable ears which differentiate them from the Indian elephant or the Asian elephant. And these enormous ears have a network of veins that transport all of the bloody blood in the body in about 20 minutes goes through those ears and into the brain so that keeps the brain cool while the body might be getting hot if you look at them now this is a big cow that's come up from the drainage line and she's watching us quite carefully this is wonderful hang on a second that's close enough Thank you. 
she's fine. She's not giving us any indication that she feels threatened. I think this youngster's bored, and so he's just coming to say hi, hello. It's just wonderful. <laughs> so, Moshe, they also don't have any hair on them, of course. And they're also very big. Now, if you're very big like this, what it means is that you take a long time to heat up, which means they can be out in the sun for longer than smaller animals without heating up. They then do take a longer time to cool down, but it does mean that they heat up slower than other animals. So that's basically how they keep cool. How oh, very wonderful to have another experience like that. I always feel truly honored when an elephant comes that close and doesn't react to us at all. Very peacefully feeding through the woodland here, browsing largely. I'm afraid the grass is probably pretty much finished for them. And while they would have spent most of the summer looking for grass, as we go to the dry season, they'll start eating more and more leaves and bark and twigs rather than the grass. And a very poor grassy season for them today, this year because we had so little rain. I always find it so useful to look at an animal behavior or elephant behavior from the point of view of human behavior and the scientists will tell you that's called anthropomorphizing things and that you shouldn't do that and to them I say piffle nonsense these elephants behave so like human beings I find we'll just watch here though the tree's about to bite the dust oh. bad luck Sisyphus. The tree won't die, everyone, but it will, will obviously be remarkably changed in shape as a result of that elephant. Um, so elephants generally behave like human beings do. You can predict how the young males are going to behave. They box with each other. They sort of sort out who's who with a bit of physical play fighting. Sometimes it escalates into real anger. The young cows don't do that. They tend to stick with their mothers uh, or in small groups and they tend to just behave in a much more gentle fashion than do the young bulls. And then the cows, the cows move around and kind of just put up with the young bulls, but they don't, they don't um, in, in exactly the same way as uh, if you imagine, I don't know, a group of women taking their kids out for a day out or they will kind of keep the youngsters away, the young bulls away, the young boys will go play on their own, the cows will chat together and feed and do what they have to do. It's almost exactly like human beings, I find. I did set across to Steph. We'll sit here with these elephants a bit longer. He has got something with eight legs to show you. At least we haven't found anything that's in a hole at the moment and uh, we found something that's on a grass and this is an orb web spider. There are many hundreds of orb web spiders. This is one of them that I don't know. Um, but definitely an orb web and she is hiding inside the inflorescence of this grass. And I know it's a she because she is web living and sedentary and males of this species of orb web spider are usually nomadic. So males of the orb webs walk from female to female. They're usually hundreds, up to a hundred times smaller than what she is. There she goes to the middle of her web. Oh, she's caught a fly. Yes. Look at that. So she felt vibrations on her web. Right here. From where she was hiding in her inflorescence, she has felt a fly fly into her web, has come down, wrapped it in silk, and then envenomated it. 
and the fly is hanging upside down. She's now upside down. Let's see if we can get a little bit closer. Have a look at that. Isn't that wonderful? That fly is probably no more than a millimeter. I'm going to see if I can put my fingernail close by. You can see how difficult it is for Brian to actually get. There she goes, there she goes. She's going back up to her larder. Typical of the orbweb spiders is to have a larder and she will then eat her fly in her grass shelter. And you can see how cryptically camouflaged she is. And that's literally so that she can stay hidden and won't be preyed on by birds. Brian doing a heroic job of actually keeping her in the frame. Wasn't that phenomenal? With all the wind blowing around today, with us speaking into her web, she still managed to distinguish the vibrations of a fly trapped in her web from easily 30 or 40 centimeters away, a foot away from where she was, came down, plucked it out, and there she is. You're now looking at her dorsal view, in other words, the top part of her, and you can see that on her abdomen, she's got those wonderful markings, and that is what you'd use to identify her in a spider book, is you'd go to the orb web section. Um, I think they are called the raniomorphs, the orb web spiders, and you will then use that very cryptically colored. Let me give you some scale. Put my, I'll put my thumbnail next to her so that you can actually see how big she is. Give you an idea of the heroic effort that Brian did in trying to keep her in focus. She's a tiny, tiny little spider. Enjoying her fly breakfast. With those striped legs and that quite cryptic black mark on her abdomen. That is what's going to be distinguishing her from any of the other spiders. And those colors that Brian just is getting, that's really amazing. There you can see her busy chewing through the fly. So what she's busy doing, she's mashing up that fly with her mouth parts, turning it into a type of jelly, and then she will suck out the insides and drop or discard the husk of that fly. Now flies are quite soft-bodied, harder-bodied insects. The venom actually turns the inside of the insect to jelly and then she sucks it out and then will use the discarded remains of her prey to further fortify her shelter. It's a very common thing that these, these, uh, these orbweb spiders do. And this year we've seen very, very few spiders, very few um, of these orbweb spiders. She's one of the latest. That really was fascinating. Well done, Brian. That's awesome. Go from something big like your elephants that you're with to something tiny like this little orbweb spider and we got to see her hunt. So, hunt and kill. Hopefully, James won't be hunt and killed by the elephants he's with. And off you go. Now, this cow who we saw a little earlier was the big one that I said possibly was listening to us and she's listening to us still and she's the only one out of this herd who I do feel is not perhaps as comfortable as the others are so let's just let her walk past I'm gonna sit very still and I'll talk you through my thought process here my thought process is that she's not upset enough for us to move if she shakes her head, I'm going to start the car and move away. She is smelling us. I think she might, she's definitely lactating. So whether she's pregnant or has a young calf, I don't know. She's not indicating discomfort. She's indicating interest. She's trying to smell us. These are some fairly intimidating spikes she has on the front of her head. She's sitting at about five meters from us now, 15 feet. Maybe three meters, 10 feet. And she goes looking into her deep amber red brown eyes. And she's watching us, you see. 
See how she turned her head towards us slightly as she walked past? She's still watching us. Look at her face. And those eyes blinking quietly. She's the only one in this herd that's paying us any attention whatsoever. She may well be the matriarch. I think, I think she is the biggest cow here. She looks to be probably the oldest. You see, that is classic displacement behavior. Where she's considering her options, taking responsibility for the rest of the herd. I think she's pregnant. She's got a real kind of a heaviness about her belly there, just in front of the tail. So maybe she doesn't have a youngster with her, and maybe she, her lactating is uh, coming as a result of a new calf about to be born, which is very exciting. Isn't that interesting? I find elephant behavior fascinating. You can talk about it for days, but you see, animals are not unpredictable. She told us how she felt as we got in here. She told us exactly how she felt. Just by looking, lifting her head up slightly, opening her ears a little bit. And you don't have to be an expert in animal behavior to understand this stuff. All you have to be is slightly aware. And Dave, I mean, I'm sure you got exactly the same sense as I did. Um, so Dave, I mean, you've been out here, what? couple of months now six, seven, six, six weeks. eight weeks and Dave's already getting a sense of what that elephant was saying even though he's you're not looking at the behavior necessarily so much as getting a, a sense yeah. Things, yeah and absolutely they're communicating that to us the rest of them couldn't care less she's watched us the whole time that we've been here I think it's fascinating Chris, you're in Australia and you ask, you know, a very nice question that dovetails with what, with what I was saying. You're saying, what's the main thing to look out for if you happen to be self-driving in, say, the Kruger National Park, which you're able to do with elephants? I think the key things, Chris, are to approach slowly. If you feel at any stage nervous, to increase distance between them. Do not try and stand an elephant down. There's no point in doing that. And secondly, to go in with an open, open mind. They will tell you how they feel. You will get a sense of their... If you feel uncomfortable around a herd of elephants, move away. And it is uncanny. The, I mean, the more and more I kind of accept that this is what they're doing, that they do talk to us in some way, or shape, shape, way, or form, uh, the more sensitive I become to how they're feeling and how each individual is feeling. So this one here, who's very young, probably about eight years old, young bull, he's watching us, but he's not, he's not irritated by us at all. He's, he's come to have a bit of a meal around where we are. Look how he's breaking those trees. And he's doing it because, well, he can have a bit of a meal, but also because he's interacting now with us. He's, he's having a, you know, he's a little bit bored. Sorry, let me get out of the way here. He's a little bit bored of his life of just eating food all day long. And so I think what he's doing is just coming to say hi. Seeing if there's any entertainment to be had from us here. See that opening his ears out? Now he's a bit nervous. He didn't want to come back. <laughs> Jennifer Kay and a few others, you're saying that the elephants here are reacting to Sam's little elephant, which is now stuck to Wendy's, <laughs> Wendy's dashboard. Um, so I don't think so, but maybe. Maybe they're just jealous of the fact that I gave Sam's elephant a flower to eat this morning. That car is still watching us. She's still watching us very carefully. See how she's lifted her head up? Her trunk is off the ground. Oh. <laughs> well, 
those to fight their way down the road, if you can believe it, the arachnophile has found another arachnid. Alrighty, we have definitely had a good morning this morning with, in terms of finding these most bizarre things. So we've got a couple of answers, before I even go into that, we've got a couple of answers on the frogs. We've got a Trevello sand frog, or we've got a snoring puddle frog that have come through. Both of which are good answers. The sand frogs and the puddle frogs are good answers. Um, I'm going to have to get back to camp and I'm going to have to go and have a look at both of those. Uh, sand frogs, Trevello sand frog, yes, distribution, perhaps not that much. Um, and then the snoring puddle frog, distribution spot on, but I'm not too sure about that smooth skin. But past that, we've come down, we literally, I came up to this bush because I wanted to have a look at what flower this was. Didn't know the answer to that. Sat down and immediately noticed the two black spots. I don't know if you can see those two black spots there. Can you see them, Brian? Two black spots, which caught my eye. And those two black spots are attached to the most bizarre spider I have ever seen in my life. See if you can see it. Brian will let me know when he's... So you're on it right now. Have a look at that. That is a spider that's probably half as big as my palm. It stretches from there is the point of his leg right to there <laughs> is the other side of his body and the body is here. Now this is not a spider that lives in a web. This is obviously a spider that uses camouflage to hunt. And I'm going to go so far as to say that this particular spider is a lynx spider, one of the lynx spiders. Lynx spiders are a collective name for spiders that are very active little hunters. And I'm going to say again that I think this is a male lynx spider. I'm not too sure of exactly what species this is. Those green spikes, the green color and these leg spikes, I actually have seen the spider um, portrayed in a book before. I just haven't, I never thought that I'd ever see one. I've never seen one before in person. And so the name is just bypassed me. But this very spiky legs, they use these legs to fend off the mouth parts of the prey that they eat. So he'll use his legs to block off uh, a struggling prey, probably find that he eats grasshoppers, being his size that he is at the moment, he eats grasshoppers. But what I actually want to talk about is this male spider, why I think it's a male. I think it's a male because of the pedipalps. Those black boxing gloves that he's got on, the end of the pedipalps, which are there in front of my piece of grass I'm holding. The pedipalps are what male spiders use to entice a female with. This particular spider will use that very contrasting color, that black contrasting on the green, to draw attention of a female's eyes in a dance. And what it'll do is he'll dance these pedipalps. What this spider does, how he dances with these pedipalps is a mystery to me, but he will have an elaborate dance that is specific to this genus and this species of spider. And what he'll do is he will act in a way that this female is programmed to accept. If he deviates from that, even for one little bit, the female will think that he's a prey species, she'll jump on him and she'll devour him. But if he gets his dance right with his pedipalps, he'll be able to move close to the female. What he will then do is pre-prepared in one of these pedipalps is a sperm packet. And he will, using his key at the end of that pedipalp on that boxing glove, insert it into her lock. And that's what they call it. It's called a lock and key mechanism. He will insert this sperm packet, which is sperm sewn into a special type of silk, into her lock. And in some species, this completely fills the cavity. They then remove their pedipalp. In other species, the pedipalp breaks off and is locked then into the female. And that's how this male spider is able to ensure that just his genes are the one that fertilizes all the female's eggs. These pedipalps are massively long and I think it is because either the female is quite a large female or because they are so absolutely camouflaged and will react to movement therefore, the pedipalps need to be long so that if she does attack him, he can get out of the way just by losing a limb perhaps or maybe only losing a pedipalp. But just an absolutely phenomenal find. 
literally I am this far away from this spider. That's how far I'm sitting. I know sometimes with the camera it makes it look a bit shallow. I'm this far away from the spider and if it wasn't for me bending down to try and smell what this, what these flowers smelled like, I would never have seen it. And here we got this lynx spider. There he moves there. You can see those black pedipalps now. Let me move this out of the way so that you can see it. But oh, there he goes. He's just a very leggy guy. Let's see if I can open him up a bit over here. Exactly, Dina, you've noticed those little hairs coming off his legs with this fantastic camera we've got. And that's it's part of his camouflage, but it'll also be helping him in prey capturing of prey. I think that he captures grasshoppers. He must capture either grasshoppers or something that stings, perhaps like a wasp or a bee. And they will use those spikes on their legs to hold their prey at bay. I've seen it with quite a few other spiders. They have these spines on their legs and they use it to hold prey at bay. Kicking prey, stinging prey or biting prey are what's held at bay by those spikes on their legs. And that'll actually be diagnostic when you go and try and identify the spider or when I go and try and identify the spider back at camp for breakfast. Is that deep green color, those long pedipalps with the black boxing gloves, the legs with those, they look reddish or blackish spikes on them. And then the distribution, i.e. where we are in South Africa, on the eastern side of South Africa, in the Kruger National Park, the central Kruger National Park, you'll find that spiders are very highly range specific and that'll help you identify the spider. But I think it's one of the lynx or one of the wolf spiders. And I think it's a male with those long, beautiful pedipalps that is now actually tucked up underneath his mouth. Ah. Frank has been very astute this morning and he thinks that it's a green lynx spider. And you know what, Frank, I'm actually going to say yes, exactly. That's what my memory tells me as a young man. One of my first natural history books I ever got as a young man. I'm talking about when I was three years old, I was given a, a spider book. And in that book is this spider. Green lynx spiders just jogged my memory from a little boy on a Sunday afternoon in the sunshine, paging through this book, endlessly paging through this book. Green lynx spider, that's exactly what it is. Male green lynx spider. And what a treat. I must be honest with you, I never thought that I'd ever see one of these in my life before. And I'm so happy that we've, we've got this wonderful camera, we've got this wonderful system, and we're in this wonderful place. But anyway, let's carry on. There's many more wonders to see. Ah, and Susie would like to know if the spider is venomous. Uh, Susie, generally the lynx spiders are not that venomous, not for us at least anyway. They're very venomous for the, for the prey that they catch. Lynx spiders are very fast, agile little hunters. He'll be hunting in that plant or green, green litter and pounce onto, onto insects. And spider venom is, the, it's funny like this, spider venom is a protein that's keyed to specific prey species. Um, we react to for instance, the recluse spiders or the widow spiders or sack spiders or violin spiders, some species of crab spider, humans react quite badly to it. But in others, insects react quite badly to it. You can imagine this spider trying to catch a wasp, for instance, with a big sting. His venom is going to need to incapacitate this wasp very, very quickly. So he's going to pounce on it, use those legs, those spiny legs to keep the thorns or keep the mouth parts away, bite that prey species and immediately that prey species will be immobilized. And that is one of the key features of that venom. This particular spider, not venom for us, but might be deadly for a, for a, uh, for a, for a wasp or a bee. But uh, that's that for me for the spider. You're going back to James. We're going to carry on to the next drainage line. Hello everybody, we've left the elephants. They went off into some thick bush. I'm just trying to see what's going on in the road here. Nothing as far as I can tell. No. Righty, we're going to go to the south of the reserve now and I'm going to drive the southern boundary to right, round about where we saw Karula and the two little cubs yesterday and we'll just see if we can't get maybe a view of her from the boundary. I don't know where she stashed her fully grown male impala 
very impressive kill that she made yesterday and that'll keep her busy for a little while but if she's put it in a tree we might just be able to spot it from the southern boundary i don't know that's the general plan we'll see what else we can find on our way that marvelous having the older mystic wood out on the walks today his knowledge of the small aspects of the wilderness and indeed the larger aspects of the wilderness i find fascinating just about all the time some of the best experiences I've had out here at Juma have been on walks with old Steph. I say old Steph, full in the knowledge that he's a year younger than I am, which is a source of deep consternation and hurt for my heart. We'll see what else we can find. Uh, lots of bird calls. Very large warthog over there. Running away, stop running away, Waterhog. Yes. Stand still. A very large Warthog, everyone. A very large Warthog sow. She's there. She's the Beyonce of Warthogs, this one. She's voluptuous. I don't believe I actually just said that. But uh, this is live, it cannot be taken back. <laughs> what I would like you to do, apart from forget that I described this warthog as the Beyonce of warthogs, <laughs> is, <laughs> is you, ca you could see there, she's got huge tusks for a warthog. And Underneath those tusks, you can see the bottom ones. Ah, uh, you can't see them anymore. You might be able to just, as she chews, those two bottom canine teeth, which rub up against the top canines every time she chews. They are the razor-sharp ones that you've got to watch out for, and they are the defensive mechanism that this warthog will use if she's ever attacked by anything. Yeah, you can just see them there. And they are razor, razor sharp. They occlude or rub against those top, top tusks every time she chews. And it means that they will slice up anything that she might get, those, get them into. So you'll find the leopard, although they're about the right size to be eating warthogs like this, are very wary of them. And it's often only male leopards that will take a, a warthog like this. So although Karula is sitting with a fully grown male impala at the moment, which weighs about the same as this female warthog, it's highly unlikely that a female leopard the size of Karula would take a warthog like this. But Tingana, hmm, he would have some very pleasant bacon on the back end of this Beyonce of warthogs. All right, uh, Dory, you're in North Carolina or South Carolina, I forget which. And you want to know about that warthog cow, sow that we saw the other day, a much smaller warthog sow than this, much smaller tusks. And she had some of her insides, unfortunately, hanging out of a fairly narrow wound just in front of her, was it her right hip? or her, I think it was her left, no, it was her right hip. And you want to know what happened to her? I, I don't know. We haven't seen her again. I'm hoping that she's either been put out of her misery by a predator or that she's healed or died quietly. Um, as I was saying, a lot of you were saying, well, it would be so nice to put her out of her misery. So often with these animals, you find that they recover from the most horrendous injuries, things that you'd never expect them to be able to. So it was definitely the right thing to just leave her be and let nature take its course. This is a much older sow. She's been particularly confiding to us. So often they run away, that's why I began whispering as we arrived here. Look at a lovely mane of hair down her back. It looks perfectly salon quality, that does. Beyonce pays a lot of money to have her hair done in the same fashion. Go a little bit forward and see if we can't get another view of her.
Well, Dave, you know, once we've started it, I suppose we should just go with it. Yep. There goes Beyonce. Now, interestingly, you know, we were chatting about the heat balance that elephants achieve and how they manage to achieve heat balance. And I said one of the reasons that they are, or, you know, one of the things they're able to do to lose heat, of course, is not have hair. And that warthog is very sparsely hairy. And the smaller you are, of course, the faster you'll heat up, but also the colder you will get. And I find it very interesting that a warthog like this does not have hair and they are actually prone to uh, sort of shocks of cold so if it gets very cold very quickly warthog will often suffer and I think it's one of the reasons that they live in burrows at night especially is because they can then use the warmth their own body warmth and the body warmth of other warthogs to stay warm and maintain the body temperature that mammals must but very sparse hair and it's normally the only, only the big animals that have sparse hair. That's actually fascinating. I wonder why. They've probably got a bit more covering of fat that gives them a bit more insulation. But certainly it's normally, you know, as buffalo get bigger, they lose their hair. We know that hippo have very little hair. Rhino and elephant have very little hair. And then everything else smaller than them tends to be fairly well covered. And the warthog is slightly different. Fantastic warthog sighting. All right, let's leave Beyonce grazing off into the wilderness there. She sings very nicely today. Perhaps she's recording a new album. That's enough of that. On we go, Dave. All the single ladies, all the single ladies. Let's go across to Steph. He's got another spider. Well, just on the back of that question that we had a little bit earlier about venomous spiders and, and, and venomous spiders to man, myself and Brian have managed to dredge up for you one of South Africa's most venomous spiders, and that's what we're going to try and show you right there. This is a violin spider, and she has a venom that is very, very, very toxic to us. Uh, she's got a cytotoxic venom. And that means that it's a cell-destroying venom. But it's so virulent, in actual fact, that if she had to bite you, not only does it create cell breakdown at the bite site, at your skin and in the soft tissue around the bite, but it also moves to all the soft tissue in your body. In other words, to your lungs, to your liver, to your intestines and to your tummy, basically breaking them down and liquefying a human. So you might think that that little spider over there looks all inconspicuous but in actual fact that is one of the most deadly things that we have out here the violin spider luckily for us she's very slow moving and she lives underneath logs and really the only time that we would get bitten by a violin spider is by carelessly picking up a stump or by the male violin spiders who are actually nomadic looking for females and sometimes come into houses but it's it's quite uncommon bites of violin spiders but when you do get bitten by one it can be quite nasty depending on how much venom was actually envenomated into you it can get quite nasty like I said cytotoxic venom and just to tie in a little bit with the story from from earlier that is definitely one of the spiders that you don't want to be bitten out by here unlike that green link spider we're gonna put her back underneath her log that's where she lives and that's where we found her and she stays there after they come out of eggs, the females will walk around, they'll disperse after they come out of eggs. They actually disperse on the wind, believe it or not. The wind would have blown this female down to the ground. She would have walked underneath the stump. She would have found out that it was unoccupied and she would have built her home there. And she will live her entire life underneath this one stump. It's one of the reasons why when we're off-road, we try not to drive over these stumps. They do harbor the most amazing things. And as you can see, it's a pretty unremarkable piece of wood that's just lying in an unremarkable place here in the bush and yet has this entire castle underneath it
Annie in Durban has just wanted to know, do we find them in Durban? Now Durban, for all of those of you who are watching around the world, Durban is a town, uh, one of the major towns in South Africa on our eastern seaboard and very close to where we are. It's probably, other than Nelspruit, it's our largest city, our closest largest city. And absolutely, Annie, you'll find them there. Violent spiders, you quite often find in your bathtubs. I find male violent spiders in my bathtub on quite a few occasions. Albeit I have been in the game reserve for more than half my life. But, uh, but yes, you will find them there. Um, they are quite easy to identify. Lots of people will talk about a violin shaped marking on their back. To be quite honest with you, that marking versus a different type of marking, quite tough. But they're very easy to identify from a picture. Lots of people have taken pictures of these, of these spiders because uh, they have such significance, medical significance. And you can quite easily Take a picture with your phone from a safe distance and correlate it to a violent spider on the net and you'll see if you'll find one. And then obviously don't touch it, whatever you do. Not a good, not a good idea. They're quite aggressive spiders. They will bite when you, when you handle them. Um, but like I said, they just live under these logs over here and they don't really pose much of a prison. Paul wanted to know if there's an antidote for this spider bite. Paul, um, no as far as I know. I, there might well be, I just don't know of one. I'm unaware of one. I'm not too sure if they have got an antidote. I don't think you get antidotes for cytotoxic venom. Basically what happens is your cell wall, unlike a plant cell wall which has a stiff or a rigid cell, cell uh, wall around it, we've just got fluid walls. We've got a cell membrane. And what this toxin does is it breaks that cell membrane. So your cell basically opens. And that is across all cells. It's about muscle cells, blood cells, lung cells, intestinal cells. You'll find that these cells open and it releases the contents of the cell, which is made up of mainly fluid with our DNA, uh, what do we call it? I can't even remember. Mitochondrions and the nucleus, and I can't remember my standard seven biology so well. But it releases that into the surrounding tissue. I'm basically liquefying you, and that's what the that's what the venom does to her prey. She bites the prey, it liquefies the prey, and then she sucks out those juices with her mouth parts. She obviously isn't going to suck out our juices. It's not what they hunt, but the toxin that she produces or the protein in her toxin does definitely work on mammal tissue, on our tissue. And she is one of six uh, spiders of medical importance in South Africa. We have the button spider or the recluse spiders. We have uh, the sack spider, we have the violin spider, and we have the six-eyed desert crab spider, excuse me, not six, four. Four medically important spiders here. She has the most virulent cytotoxin of all of them though. And uh, yeah, one of the most common ones we find out here. She was quite easy to find. All right, let's carry on going. And Ah, Simon is, is obviously because of the remarkable find we had with that green lynx spider. Simon has asked, are lynx spiders invasive into South Africa? Because he's gone to go and research on what these lynx spiders are. And Simon, no, uh, lynx spiders are definitely indigenous. They're definitely not an exotic. However, lynx spiders are very common spiders found throughout the world. So you'll find that on your continent, in your country, and probably in your state, you have lynx spiders that are endemic to your area, but lynx spiders as a whole um, are very common all over the world. So you do get local lynx spiders. We have quite a few different species of lynx spiders. And that one that we just saw there was a local endemic or indigenous species of spider, the green lynx spider. Absolutely not an invasive species as far as I understand. Nice question though. It's always good to ask about invasive and alien, alien species. In areas like this, quite uncommon to find alien or invasive species. Uncommon, I say, you don't really find them. Um, we have found a snail that seems to be an invasive species. But other than that, not really that much. We live in a really pristine, beautiful place here. But on that note, we're going to send you back through to James. And we're going to carry on through this pathway here and hopefully get to this drainage line we've been meaning to. I'm sure I'd describe what Steph's walking along as a pathway so much as a spider gauntlet. Um, I imagine there are a number of you watching who are arachnophobic as we speak, and uh, you're probably cringing every time I say we're going to link across to Steph for him to show you another terrifying arachnid. Obviously, the violin spider he just showed you was by far 
the most terrifying that he's showed you. Uh, they can be very nasty indeed. What is uh, euphemistically called medically important spiders in this country. Very few of them. Six, I think. I'm sure Steph took you through all of that. Right, we're now on Ledwood Road, the last sighting of, that I ever had of quarantine and Konyuma was around here. I always drive along here in the vain hope that I might spot one of them. But then we will hit the Mulwati drainage, which is the big, well, big, is another sort of hyperbolic term for the dry stream that runs through the middle of Juma. Uh, we'll hit that and with any luck we'll get a little view down to the south the leopard and her babies. I don't think we're going to. I think I'm being over ambitious. But let's hope. Let's see. <laughs> Richard, you say, we've had a Kardashian kudu, a Taylor Lautner buffalo, and a Beyonce warthog. And you want to know if I read the tabloids when I'm on my off time. Um, I don't, I don't by default, but I suppose you come across these things if you, if you spend any time on social media at all. Uh, you're bound to eventually be bombarded with the nonsense of celebrity lives. So I, I don't think I'm as a au fait with, with these things as many, but I read the odd thing here and there. One must keep up with social culture, you know, James, otherwise one becomes a dinosaur very quickly. You know, all these young bucks I work with, I have to try and keep up with what they're talking about. The time I, half the time I'm just nodding and waving. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's very funny. I don't know what they're talking about. No idea. Janita, um, you asked a very, very broad question. Are there any deve de 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 developmental conservation projects going on in South Africa right now? Uh, thousands, thousands and thousands. The Kruger National Park has got a, uh, an entire scientific services division which conducts thousands of research projects all every year. Um, there are private entities like the Kruger to Canyons Biosphere, uh, Panthera, who we work with, that do extensive research on both people and parks, the animals in the parks, the relationship of um, uh, tourism to conservation, every kind of sort of research gets done. There are uh, faculties at just about every single university in the country that are dedicated to environmental sciences and the sort of, you know, the consequences of environment uh, to human beings and to animals. And so, yeah, I mean, that's a very broad question. There's masses of research going on. Uh, if you've got something more specific, if I'm being a bit general about it, um, I can maybe answer that for you. But yes, in general, thousands of research projects going on. Students, NGOs, government, you name it. It's the one thing that our dear government hasn't managed to botch completely is, uh, is the national park system, which is still very much intact. Uh, the lead wood that I'm just looking at. I saw a lead, uh, a fig tree growing up it the other day, but that seems to have been devoured by some nasty predator of fig trees. All right, so yeah, we are approaching the Mulwati drainage line now. And we're going to keep a look out to the left-hand side here and see if we can't spot our favorite friend, Karuna, Her Majesty. And George and Charlotte is what I shall call the little ones until told to do otherwise. And ease our way down here very slowly. There, there. <laughs> Not the leopard, but we can certainly see the people looking at the leopard. 
we'll have a look. You can't see the leopard, can you? No. I don't know that they can either, but no, they can. They're looking up into... They're looking up into the fringing riverine vegetation. One of them has a lens almost as long as Brent Leo Smith's, but not quite that long. So I don't think we're going to get a view, I'm afraid, but that's where she is. So just to give you an idea, that is probably what, Dave, about 200 meters? Yeah. She's probably about 200 meters into the south property to the south of us. And for those of you who are new viewers, um, Human property laws dictate that we cannot cross the border here. But you can see there are no fences. So we had a view of this female leopard aged 12 with her two three-month-old cubs yesterday. They were coming along this road and they moved in here. She killed an impala there yesterday and she obviously hung it up in a tree and then she went to fetch the cubs and brought them through here. And the only way we'll get a good view of her or any view is if she has hoisted that kill into a tree. Then we might get a view, but not probably not with this camera. I can't see anything there, I'm afraid. Oh, it's almost worse having her this close to the boundary than, uh, than further away, because we know she's so close and we could just sort of drive in there and look at her. But we're not going to. We don't want to be arrested, do we, Dave? No. Nope. No. Ah, yeah! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, Enjoy your drive, please behave yourselves. His radio went crazy because of our broadcast equipment. Anyway, that's from Chitra Chitra. I'd like his jersey there. I might steal it from him next time I see him. And he's going to go and see the leopard. The old thing. For those who missed yesterday's afternoon's drive, and uh, well, I have to ask where on earth you were, because coming straight down the hill here, as we turned onto it, was Karula and the two little ones. So special. Let's go across the step while the signal's bad. So have a look at this absolutely ginormous termite mound. It's really as big as a small house to be quite honest. This is a termite mound. Macrotermies and what got us very nervous was this hole here and what I mean very nervous is that these holes are quite often uh, lived in by warthog or, or inhabited by a warthog and warthog reverse into their homes so that their tusks face any danger on the outside and they'll come shooting out of these holes at tremendous speed and so walking in front of them is actually quite dangerous but in this particular instance this particular hole is now inhabited by a group of porcupine so this has become a and I know that because pigs don't leave this that's covered in roots lots of roots lots of these messy entrances that is definitely a porcupine burrow what I might actually try and do and see if I can find you some cools to prove my theory. I want to stick my head too deep inside you. I've been growled at by holes before. <laughs> they, uh, quite often leopard will also stash cubs inside these things and I once mistakenly as a young guide without giving fair warning to the hole before sticking my face in there stuck my head into a hole and was growled at quite badly. 
and um, I'm definitely not that keen on wearing an, a leopard as a swimming cap. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, do you. so more evidence that this is a porcupine hole is right here and what's happened is these porcupines have started to dig into the roots of these trees or dig for the roots of these trees and you can see the evidence thereof is definitely not dug by an aardvark and you can see that just by the roots that have been excavated and chewed on and chewed out and similarly on this side there's another one here so a family of porcupine have moved into this hole and moved into this area and they'll be here for as long as what there's food in this area and then they'll move on and they'll move into another termite mound and they'll begin their excavations of the area around there. Nocturnal as well, just like the odd fark and just like the pangolin. Susie has asked if I can find a quill and Susie it's not for lack of trying that, I've, that I haven't found you a quill to be honest and it's, it's giving, it's debasing my theory of, uh, of porcupines by the second but usually porcupines shed a lot of their quills and usually you find a lot of quills around excavation sites like this just right now I haven't found a single quill I'll carry on looking as we're walking around here definitely and hopefully I'll be able to pluck one out to give my theory on this being a porcupine excavation some credibility and for now all I'm making it is on these messy things they're messy porcupine excavations are messy the fact that you can definitely see where roots have been pulled out and chewed and and discarded haphazardly that definitely doesn't look like an aardvark or a pangolin excavation who are after termites that's definitely a porcupine although please don't only take my word for it you're welcome to have your own theory until I can prove it with an animal. <laughs> so, Megan all the way from Ottawa has asked me to find her honey badger house. Uh, Megan, my favorite animal is a honey badger. I didn't know if you, if you knew that or not. And for years I've been looking for honey badger houses. I know of one um, honey badger house. It's at a game reserve called Moholo Holo. And they've got a, a honey badger there called Stoffel. I know it sounds like a bizarre name, but Stoffel the honey badger is a very, very famous honey badger. Um, and I highly recommend that you go on YouTube, Stoffel the honey badger. He's, uh, he's got a... a, a pinch on for being a bit of an escape artist and you can see documented how he escapes from his home. Other than that honey badgers also live in homes like this in holes in termite mounds and in fallen down stumps um, and excavations of their own. They're really good diggers and they will excavate their own uh, dens and burrows for the day. They're nocturnal in this area. As soon as you start heading towards the Kalahari and the Kalahari basin they become more diurnal and I think it's because the evenings are so cold and or there's a lack of food there and they need to just forage for longer periods to sustain their high metabolism. But here you hardly ever see honey badgers during the day. Every now and again you do. And on, especially on these walks we do get them. But uh, definitely haven't found myself a honey badger home just yet. <laughs> the closest one I know of is Stoffel and his, his prison. Alright, so we are going to now, myself and Brian have crossed over the watershed to another drainage line system and this one is a it's a it's quite a bizarre system of drainage lines as you'll see here in front of us it's made of these quite shallow depressions and it's very convoluted it twists and turns through this through this environment here quite deep flows and this is one of the drainage lines that fills Vuyatela Dam and one of the reasons why when it rains really, really hard here, Voyatella Dam fills up so quickly is because he's got these really big drainage lines draining from inside Biffles Hook through Juma or Western Gauri and into Biffles Hook Dam or, excuse me, into Voyatella Dam. All right. So while we carefully thread our way through here so that we don't yak our way into a buffalo, I'm going to throw you over to James and catch up a bit later. I do hope he doesn't walk into a buffalo. That would be of great sadness for Steph to walk into a buffalo. Um, we just stopped here because you can see the sun breaking through the clouds there over the Drakensberg Mountains and the low hanging 
cumulus clouds that have sort of formed over the mountains there have caught a sort of subtle golden lemonish light and I thought it was very pretty so I thought we'd stop here and have a look there anyway nothing particularly earth-shattering I did take a picture of it of course with this extremely clever app of mine and um, I've managed to make it look completely unlike it really does now David of course is a fine fine for 12 do you take photographs David I do an but he has a very fine eye for these things and what he's going to do when he shows you this picture that I've taken is going to, he's going to say to me less is more in reference to the fact that I have used all sorts of different effects on this photograph yes David what do you think it's quite pretty James but do you think less is more uh, perhaps not in this case <laughs> That's a high praise indeed <laughs> anyway there we go, a new desktop photograph. I'll send it to all who wish to pay at least $700 for it. <laughs> what a load of nonsense. Okay, just up ahead here is a gnu. A single bull who's found himself a very small postage si stamp sized piece of territory. And I think the mating of the gnus is done. So those females who gave birth this year and very successfully raised their youngsters to about six months now I think they'll all be pregnant and so this chap over here will be spending increasingly increasing amounts of time with herds of impala and zebra we saw was it today it was yesterday we saw the zebra with um, a wildebeest sorry it was this morning and I've gone mad. Was it this morning? Was it yesterday afternoon? We haven't seen zebra and wildebeest today, have we? Uh, no, we had some zebra and impala. Ah, we had zebra and impala. Thank you. That's what I thought. Kirsten's going mad. This is because her hair is the same color as that of an impala, and so she's just sort of inherently biased towards them. Um, because they don't occur in big herds here and that means that the bulls if they want to maintain their safety will have to hang around this is sort of within their territories whatever comes through their territories they will seek the company of in order to avoid predators and it's quite a clever idea he's scratching his head on the, the bush there and he was lying down in the clearing here sorry the ram drive raid is very loud this morning he was lying down in the clearing because that's what they do in their little territories. He'll have a rubbing post somewhere around here. He'll have his midden. You can see his midden, Dave. If you come down, you can see this pile of dung here. That's his, uh, that's his little midden, which tells everybody that this is his spot. And he'll be close to water. He's not too far from Treehouse Dam. And so that will be the sort of makeup of his little territory. <laughs> It's a particularly light-coloured wildebeest bull, which I think is quite interesting. I've just started to notice, and it's amazing how many obvious things there are here. How many obvious things there are that are, you miss. They've got a great variation in colour, do the wildebeest. All right, we're going to leave him be. Steph has got a very religious insect to show you. As James says, we've found the most amazing thing in this branch. We've come through a grove of sneezewood trees and I was just plucking off a leaf and Brian found this little guy hiding in the leaf litter. But have a look at this camouflage that you're looking at. That is an animal, everybody. Well, not an animal in our sentence, it's an insect. And that is a leaf-like... Oh, we've got branches in the way. Let me just give... And Brian, a hand that is a leaf like mantis, praying mantis, and is using that superb camouflage to hunt for insects that would come and land on these leaves. But have a look at that. Even those fabulous grasping claws on the front of their body look like a leaf. Massive eyes on the head. Obviously, you can it, it almost has 360 degree vision. Very, very good vision. Picks up movement, silhouetted against the sky as insects will come into land. 
you will then stalk and shoot out those forearms. Those forearms are triple segmented. In other words, that big bulb in the front underneath the eye actually has a grasping claw and it is attached all the way on the thorax behind the head and can extend probably probably about the length of the body in front of that praying mantis. So shoot out those arms, grasp the prey, bring it to the mouth and then bite into it, usually just biting the head off really. Praying mantises have that nasty reputation or lady praying mantises have that nasty reputation of biting the heads off of their mates. Have a look at that. Curled over abdomen looking exactly like the leaf that she's on. She's hunting in a sneezewood tree and these sneezewood leaves look exactly like her abdomen. Have a look at that. Isn't that amazing? And have a look at this camouflage. When we, when we put this tree back together again, there is a very, very deadly little predator that's living inside there for anything that is flying around wanting to land on a sneezewood tree today. And that's a days like this after we've looked at the violin spider which can kill you by liquefying your insides and the wolf spider which have long spikes on their legs to stick into you and the praying mantises which will catch you in the face when you land on the branch that I'm very happy that I'm a 160 pound man that stands six foot tall walking around with Brian another equally big giant here and um, I'm very happy that I don't get hunted by these types of things you know compared to Compared to them, lions and leopard and elephant and buffalo are, um, are chump change, really, to be quite honest. Very happy. Let's carry on down here. Well, we are sorry about you losing picture there with old Steffi and his praying mantis. They've maybe run out of battery. It has come sort of to the end of the drive. Anyway, we may be very lucky and spot something spectacular in the next four or five minutes. Very nice to be working with Steph out in the field again. Kirsten says there are five minutes left to drive. F double A B. The very pleasant atmosphere of the morning now. It is it has been quite chilly. And I wonder if this front isn't starting to break up. I don't know. I thought it was going to do that yesterday afternoon. It was quite sunny yesterday afternoon. It was very cloudy this morning as we came across the painted wolves. Of course, there was a lot of lighting. One of the interesting things that happens, of course, is that you can't, and the cameramen are at pains to now try and explain this to us, which is great. I, I managed to get one compliment for my driving this morning, is that when you are driving along and you're chasing wild dogs on the hunt with guests on the back of the vehicle, you just follow the dogs. But of course, with a camera, the camera moving around like this does not make for a great picture. And so, for a long time, in fact, until today, I've been shouted at because I keep following animals when they're hunting rather than letting the zoom or letting the camera follow it. And we managed today to stop. And I, managed, I went for the key and I thought, no, 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 don't. And I took my hand off the key. And we got that lovely picture of the dog running across the front of the screen with the impala running and it was all static and steady and wonderful. So David said, well done to me there. It was a great compliment. Normally I don't get compliments for my driving. I always know it's coming when jean for example, says, um, would you like to debrief that sighting? Yeah. Okay, and then a litany of complaint pouring out. 
up the other day. <laughs> we nearly lost Dave off the back of the vehicle. We had those lions going across the clearings here. And we were driving along, flying, and I went over a bump and bounced out, and I didn't even look behind me. And, and no, sorry, I did. I looked, as I looked behind me, I just saw Dave's legs in the air. He sat back up, the camera was facing the sky, the lion was running next, and I was going, look at the lion running! And all you guys saw were clouds doing this all over the place. Entirely my fault. We're going to say goodbye to you now. Big thanks to you, David, for your efforts today and every day indeed. And we'll hand you back to Steffi for the final few minutes. See you this afternoon. Bye-bye. Yeah. What a wonderful morning. You know, it started off in the dark. It started off cloudy and, uh, and James with his promise that he was going to find wild dog. And absolutely goes and finds them. I mean, it was actually quite phenomenal. For myself and Brian, started off a bit slow. We, we decided to go walk in a block we've never walked before, and things just sort of unfolded for us the whole time. We saw some amazing things. Snoring puddle frog, as far as we've got it, or Trevella sand frog. Violin spider, green link spider, something that I haven't seen before. And um, all these little leaf-like praying mantis. We've seen some worms. It's, it's been a crazy morning. It's been a really pleasurable morning. Oh, and of course, the porcupine hole, which I think is a porcupine castle. Um, James, some elephants. The ladies have been fantastic in final control. You, as always, all the awesome questions that keep us motivated and keep us going. Really, thank you very much for that. And uh, we'll definitely be available this afternoon for the afternoon drive. Now, um, I've just been asked a question by James Henry, but I have no idea what it was. I'm getting a bit of static coming through on my radio. <laughs> but in any case, I just want to say from myself and Brian, from James and from David, and from the ladies in Final Control, absolutely goodbye.